Hey guys, uh, so welcome to episode um, 5, I think we're up to. Uh, today, yet again, we're talking with Dr. Scott Wustenberg from Optimal Life Chiropractic. Um, we talk a lot about uh, gluten um, and we go through all of the possible scenarios about why gluten is bad for you and how that may be affecting people. Uh, it was a lot of fun. I try to get Scotty to admit that um, late harvest wine isn't so bad, uh, but it didn't work out. Um, and I have to apologize. Towards the end, my microphone decided to be a bit of a bugger. Uh, and so there's a bit of a hiss in terms of my end. But it's not nearly as bad as the bloody rainforest that's going on in Queensland when we were recording this. There are parrots and birds and all sorts of wildlife going on in the background. Uh, so apologies for that. I'm going to ask Scotty to turn down the forest next time we uh, do one of these. All right, guys, enjoy a good old rant about gluten and genetically modified crops and Monsanto, uh, we go off the rails a little bit. Um, enjoy. Yes. <laughs> um, but yeah, so my camera's not working, but um, I look exactly the same as I usually do. Um, so I'll cool. get to see you. Oh, wait, no. Can you see me now? Oh. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. right. uh, well, so sorry, buddy. <laughs> that's, that's quite okay. I'm not too worried. It's working. Yeah. That's all that matters. Um, yeah. So, mate, today... I wanted to talk to you mm-hmm. about the demon that is gluten. Um, okay. So a few thoughts. Um, one thing I wanted to know was, as um, I know sort of personally that, um, you know, I do have a reaction to gluten, um, but I've found that if I am eating gluten in Europe, um, I don't respond mm-hmm. um, or I don't react um, nearly as much as I do to Australian gluten. So I'm wondering, is it the gluten component in the wheat that's causing the reactions or is it the crap that they're spraying the crop with that I'm reacting to? Um, and then it's, yeah, run, run me through it. How does gluten sensitivity work? <laughs> You've got 40 minutes. Oh, that is a... <laughs> I've got 40 minutes. That is a huge can of worms. Um, so there's there's multiple parts to that. And, and the answer is we don't totally know which component is the one that makes a difference to you being in Europe mm. eating the same obvious food. What we know is that uh, the gluten in itself in the plant has been certainly in Australia and I'm assuming around the world selectively bred to suit the conditions uh, that are available in that area. Now if we think about say England versus or France as a great example versus uh, here in Australia we've got quite different weather conditions, we've got really different soils, we've got different amounts of heat, different amounts of Mm. sun. So what we have is is the agronomists actually spend their entire year selectively breeding different strains of wheat. And so there's there's actually huge amounts of, of different strains of wheat. And there's old forms, which we might know as things like spelt and kamut. And they have much, much lower gluten content. Now, gluten's attached to these things called heat shock protein. And as the heat shock proteins are bred in higher amounts into the plant, because they help the plant survive crappy growing conditions, such as like 40 degree days and drought conditions and super uh, windy conditions, the amount of gluten uh, seems to go up at the same time. Mm. So what we we know in, in say, Europe is that they have a a much deeper uh, soil base. So the topsoil might be like two meters deep, which has got uh, thousands of years of... um, you know, plant mulch breaking down, whereas, you know, the Australian topsoil might be a couple of feet thick at best and is very old and it's very, very hard to grow food in. Now, you ask any farmer how difficult it is to get constant yield, notwithstanding that we, we've now altered how we're actually growing food. So the growing of food now becomes like we'll do one crop and then a cover crop and then the same crop again. So we're constantly pulling the same nutrients out of the soil, whereas, you know, hundreds of years ago in different parts of the world, we'd do multiple different sorts of food growing in the same area. So it was far less intensive and we'd kind of mulch uh, a lot of the, the, the waste material back in so it would break down and re-nourish the so soil again. the farming practices making the soil yeah. healthier. 
And, and that's not to say that the founders aren't doing the absolute best, but it's recognized worldwide that uh, Australia is some of the hardest growing conditions because of the lack of nutrient in the actual soil itself. Mm. We've got the largest zinc mine in the world called the uh, Century Mine here in Queensland with the lowest amount uh, of zinc in the soil. And, and I kind of imagine that it was like, like a meteorite just kind of smack bang into to Queensland. And that was all the zinc in Australia just in one spot um, because it's really, really low everywhere yeah. else. So the plants, plants have different levels of nutrients and so that's changed them. Now, one of the other interesting things that you'll get to see, like if you ever saw the movie Gladiator with uh, Russell yep. Crowe, and you see him walking in the in the wheat fields and they're all kind of up to about his waist height and he's touching the ears, you know, and it's kind of a beautiful scene. And that's not how it is here. Like a, a wheat plant growing here is about, you know, oh, maybe eight inches tall. It's really, really low to the ground. So we've, we've selectively bred these properties to have a much shorter stalk so that it takes up far less moisture and it's not susceptible to be blown over by the massive, strong, heavy winds that come out of the west and the cyclones that we're much more susceptible to. So overall, what we get is that the, the plant here is selectively bred and grown for really different conditions. Therefore, what's in the plant, whether it's the, the gluten, gliadin, heat shock proteins or lectins, is actually... Uh, quite different and so one of the other things that it may actually be is that we're actually potentially having a reaction to the amount of lectins that are actually in that um, mm. in that plant as well and so there's there's a, a wonderful so a, a lectin, uh, lectin. to the heat shock protein as well or what's the difference between a lectin and a what is a lectin let's go well, okay so so a lectin is a protein that's found in pretty much all plants and they have multiple different properties they help with uh, cell signaling and they basically act as a fungicide and a herbicide for the plant okay, cool. gotcha. to to, to stop it actually getting destroyed by pests and, and other yeah. things. And so there's this really interesting uh, couple of lectins out there uh, in, in the, the actual gluten plant, and one of which basically has been debated for about 20 years to actually be uh, the gluten-causing, um, oh, sorry, the celiac-causing um, mm lectin um, in, in the wheat. So it's in the wheat plant and it binds to the HLA receptors and it actually activates uh, an immune response in the person and has been suggested that it's actually really the cause of the issue as against anything else. So that yeah. could explain now, why you're, you're turning up negative to gluten uh, intolerance and then you know, you're still eating gluten and reacting regardless yeah, that, of that's, than the gluten. That's absolutely it. And so the lectin actually um, binds to the human intestinal mucosa and it, it damages it. And this starts off this uh, autoimmune response. Um, it also binds to the, um, the glomerular capillary walls and it, it creates all sorts of problems in the kidneys. Um, you know, it binds to IgA and it'll actually induce IgA mesangial deposits to occur. And so fundamentally, you can get kidney disease because of this particular lectin response in the body. So as I say, it's not exactly clear cut as to why people respond differently. Um, but my assumption is because of how we grow our, our food here versus Europe, we're getting a, a different concentration of these different proteins that your immune system's reacting to. Now, you then raise the other possibility. One of the possibilities is that we definitely here in Australia, and I can't speak for the rest of the world, I know that Europe's been, been looking at banning some of these things, but glyphosate, which is a, a, um, a herbicide, mm. um, and it's commonly used uh, in the agricultural practices, uh, is shown to damage the gut lining and create celiac disease-like symptoms in people with acne genetic predisposition towards it. 
So it may be that the volume of uh, glyphosate in food in Europe is quite different to what it is here. So we're not getting that constant damage to our tight junctions and therefore the immune system is not overactivating and that's why we don't get as many problems. You read, um, or I've read, you know, you read different things and, you know, depending on which Facebook group you're intending, you're reading it's either, you know, agriculture and GMO crops are the things that have saved, you know, the, the famine crisis um, through to, you know, GMO crops are the, the devil and they're killing people. Um, but absolutely, what, what I'd read was that um, um, Europe has essentially um, sort of prevented Monsanto yeah. uh, crops from getting into, which is why it's sort of not as GMO. They're, they're a bit more of a um, ancient grain as opposed to what we're getting exposed to in, in Australia. Um, that. That definitely seems to be the case. Um, like, it, it's not just Monsanto; it's all the, the massive agri companies. They are huge. They control the grain supplies to a large degree. They control the sprays. You know, there might be four major companies that control maybe 70, 80 percent of all the um, the food supply and food crops at that particular moment in time. And you know, there's definitely some benefits to to GMO. We have been manipulating and GMOing and, and people want to argue with me on, on this, but we have been selectively breeding our plants. So, you know, when I'm talking about those those eight inch tall crops, that they're not uh, genetically modified necessarily in a lab. They are selectively crossbred over a period of time. But, you know, we're doing this in four cycles a year. So they are shoving these things through really, really fast. So that kind of what you and I might think of as, as a, a long period of time, actually, for them is, is rather rapid. And we get a lot of change in these plants very, very quickly. So uh, the, the GMO effect is not the devil, uh, but some of the responses, because we've altered our plants, could cause some serious deleterious effects for human beings and animals as well, because these chemicals have some negative impacts. One of the, the things that they, they do, some of these herbicides, pesticides, will actually block your enzymatic functions. And since all of your body's uh, functions actually rely on enzymes to do things like create energy or otherwise, you know you're in a lot of trouble that way. The pest, pesticides are great because they're uh, generally um, xenoestrogenic, so they're targeting the female pest of the species and, and creating alterations of their ability to actually create offspring. And so, of course, if that's uh, in, in your food because it was sprayed on, it doesn't break down very quickly. And therefore, from that particular point of view, the in food that we're eating may also have a deleterious effect on the females of our species, which might be why, uh, you know, fertility and, and oncology are some of the fastest growing medical practices in the world. Would you expect to see a difference in terms of symptoms from, um, like, lectin versus gluten sensitivity versus, um, uh, like, glyphosate tissue? Would, would they react differently with the body? The unfortunate thing is, by all appearances, no. If you damage the gut lining from whichever source, whether it's too much alcohol, glyphosate, gluten, uh, you know, chlorine, etc., ultimately, what we're doing is is damaging the gut lining, allowing the leaking of undigested proteins and particulate matter to get into the bloodstream activating an immune response, creating swelling and malnourishment. So pretty much in most of these instances, the actual response is pretty much the same and it's quite hard to differentiate between them all. You kind of can't go, ah, that's a glyphosate reaction. Now, you can ultimately test for these things and we can look at uh, like whether the antibodies come from one sort of thing or other. Um, but, you know, I tend to recommend people eat organic and avoid gluten as much as you can and not have too many grains and ferment their, their legumes and beans, etc., so that they're slightly activated and that reduces the lectin content. Is there a way of testing um, forks? I don't know, like you get your you know, hair analysis test or whatever to see what your heavy metal um, levels are. Is there anything you can do for glyphosate levels? Um, there certainly are tests to, to look at um, chemicals. Um, they're really difficult to manage in the human being because unlike heavy metals, which have a really big uh, molecular weight and are actually quite 
uh, kind of easy to find. Um, most of your your chemicals such as glyphosate, etc., are all very, very small molecules, and they all tend to like to hide in, in body fat. So they're not very available in the body to actually uh, test, unless it's like instantaneous exposure. Mm -hmm. But yeah, some of them are actually available. We can do PCB testings and um, zen, different xenoestrogens, but it's not quite so easy as, oh, look, let's test for some lead, or let's, even that's not very easy, because the body likes to store that in places like long bones. Okay. Okay, yeah. So, essentially, it's so it's most unless you're sort of actively burning off the fat that your body's been using as a dumping ground for all of these things. That's, that's pretty much it. And this is kind of one of the reasons why people who've, who've become a bit overweight and then go on, you know, I'm changing my diet, I'm doing some energy, I'm, I'm burning the fat off, and then they kind of come down sick with lots of symptoms and they don't want to do it anymore because they feel crap. Because they, their, um, their fat cells are starting to dump all the garbage out, and lo and behold, you feel rubbish because of it. Yeah, I've certainly found that um, if I go through a fasting phase where I'm doing like a, a period of intermittent fasting, I still get that, you know, a couple of days into it. Bit of reactivity, headaches, that sort of thing, and then oh yeah, yeah it, 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 it's good because I'm getting stuff out of the crappy fat cells. But then on the other hand, it's like why do I feel like crap? Uh, <laughs> That's exactly it. So it's essentially um, um, like would it be fair to say it doesn't really matter what? Uh, I suppose a better question would be so if it's a gluten sensitivity or caused by gluten or lectin or glyphosate, it doesn't really matter because once you get that gut immunity reactivity to the other gluten or lectin or you like your nightshades and all the other high probability uh, allergens. That, that's exactly it. So um, one of the really interesting things as you were mentioning the nightshades there. So nightshades contain um, lectins in the first mm. place and so p potato tomato actually is a um, uh, a lectin containing food. However, one of the really interesting things is that um, a, a GMO version of the tomato has actually had um, the, the um, uh, a component of latex rubber. So mm. there's this um, chemical called prohevin, which is a lectin, and it's the, the component or number one component of uh, allergy response um, in uh, the latex rubber. So people who put gloves on and they get the, um, the reactions, etc. Mm. Now that has been crossbred or GMO put into tomatoes because it acts as a natural fungicide. And so there's a real interesting possibility that people who are actually... Um, sensitive to the latex rubber are actually developing a uh, tomato allergy simply because of that particular occurrence and you wouldn't necessarily know that that was occurring because of course it doesn't uh, require herbicides or otherwise it's put in there to stop fungus growing to help give you a better yield How did, yeah um, so the um, family that's, uh, that, that's tomatoes potatoes eggplant what, what else is in there uh, potato, tomato, eggplant, capsicum, um, chili to some degree, um, tobacco. And is there, so do you become, um, so you, like, okay, so do you become, is the lectin um, the same sort of, uh, you know, chemically, does that molecule look the same regardless, like in the nightshade only, is it, so are you reacting to that or is it you start to get inflamed to one part of the nightshade family and then your body starts to recognize the rest of the nightshade family because it looks somewhat similar. Like that's the cross reaction. No, no. So the, the, it depends on what you're actually reacting to. So in the first instance, there's multiple different uh, lectins. There's huge amounts of them. And there's different amounts of lectin per plant. So certain, certain foods you'll be, uh, will have a higher content of lectin, so you're more likely to react, and others have less lectin. There are toxic lectins and there are non-toxic lectins. Um, so it, it's not really easy to determine any of those things. And so you might eat one type of tomato and it doesn't really cause you any issues. Maybe like an acid-free Roma tomato and then another one which is full of flavor, etc., causes you all sorts of gut ache. Like, I, I kind of look at them kind of simplistically because the lectins have been in our food for, for massive periods of time. And, and along with phytates, they tend to be uh, in higher concentration when the plant's fruit, whichever, you know, a tomato or an apple or whatever, is 
not ripe yet. And so it tends to have a really interesting impact on us insofar as if you imagine we were all hunter-gatherers umpteen hundred thousand years ago and we're traipsing through the, the, the bushes and we stumble across a tomato plant and we see these mostly kind of greeny red, um, you know, f- fruit on it and we go wow look food I haven't eaten for six days and guts ourselves on the thing and then we traipse on down the forest and we're like a half an hour down the path and suddenly we get diarrhea that's the effect of lectins and phytates because they're there to irritate your gut to actually cause you to get rid of the seeds of the plant you just ate because that's their ability to actually regerminate. And so when you poop it out, of course, you're fertilizing, you've got the fertilizer there, you're away from their original site, you're spreading. And I'm sure this happens in all... Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, there's a bunch of these these things in the evidence in the literature about showing how the, the plant's life cycle is actually designed to do these things. And so, you know, you've still got the benefits of the rest of the plant, but you, of course, kind of... Oh, my tummy, it hurts. It's also a learning thing because, of course, if you eat it when it's too unripe, it's going to give you a gut ache and then it's going to teach you not to eat that thing in the future. So you're suggesting that if I am going to drink wine, I should go late harvest wine because lectin components can... Well, that's, that's what you're saying, right? <laughs> that might be what I'm not saying anyway. <laughs> um, so yeah, yeah, ages, good. Is that where, I mean, uh, I think I had this chat with you ages ago, but the um, uh, like current farming techniques would be to um, like they're picking fruit early while it's got that high lectin component that's not getting a chance to um, what's the word I'm looking for? Delectinize. Um, yeah, ripen. Yeah, so yeah. like we're, we're, um, when it's ripening off the vine. Uh, and then you're eating it, it's still got that high lectin component. <laughs> That, that's exactly what it seems. It's both the lectins and the phytates at that moment. And so, again, uh, the unnatural ripening practices don't seem to actually decrease the amount that's in it. Um, and again, as I say, different plants all by themselves will have greater and lesser amounts. So um, I can't kind of... Is, um, is the, sort of the lectin or the, the component of the nightshade family, um, is it similar to gluten in where that we've added the heat shock protein, which is up to the... Um, sort of, you know, gram for gram um, amounts of gluten per uh, plant. Has has it been a similar thing with um, modifying nitrates? Are they more lectin-y? Um... That's, a, that's an interesting question. Uh, firstly, we haven't added the heat shot proteins. The heat shot proteins are always there. We've just concentrated them more because of selective breeding okay. patterns. T- yeah, two, um, I suspect that's the case with the other things like um, potato, tomato. I haven't actually looked at it because it's not, they don't come up as big as a problem for me and my patient base as things like gluten and dairy products do. So dairy products have lectins in them as well. Have you ever um, had you someone know, who- just purely nightshade sensitive and not gluten or dairy sensitive like it seems that if you've got one you're almost bound to have gluten and dairy sensitivity um I haven't had anyone who uh, no I've had two patients who gluten and dairy weren't their problems whatsoever one of them had like 27 allergies and the other had over 50 so you know I I wasn't winning on that one particularly easily however um basically what I, I see I think partially because of our Western diet now that's become so very concentrated to such a small amount of foods um, the the volume of irritation from potato tomato you know kids eat tomato sauce eat tomato on everything uh, potato is in everything you know whether it's as a starch blended up into some packet food or potato chips potato fries potato cakes you know it's everywhere so certain foods i think we're having such a concentration of these things going in that the immune system's getting beat up by it and we're also getting as i, I mentioned earlier and alluded to chlorine is a really good antibacterial and so it does a great job when it's added to our municipal supply of killing off bacteria unfortunately the bacteria that it kills off is not the stuff only in the pipe before it gets to your stomach it's like you know you 
pour, turn the tap on and pour it in your glass and you drink it down and there's still chlorine in it. And that chlorine will also kill your gut bacteria. And further, it will actually damage the tight junctions between your, your mucosal cells and allow leaking to occur at the same point in time. Now that sets you up for a whole bunch of problems. And you know, there's a bunch of other situations we could talk about like uh, antibiotics, absolute godsend, save thousands and thousands of lives. But excessive use of these things where perhaps the person might have had a viral infection and didn't need an antibiotic has set some people up for a whole lot of leaky gut and killed off their good bacteria, making them a lot more dysregulated and pro-inflammatory at that moment in time. So again, antibiotics are great. Don't let me say anything bad about them. It's just that we've set up, I think, because of perhaps inappropriate use previously, situations that aren't quite so good for us. So it, it's not always just purely the lectin's fault or the food's fault or wheat's fault, etc. There are a whole bunch of combinations of our lifestyle things that are adding up into yeah, this. Food, food just being a lot more available um, now compared to years ago. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, when you kind of think about it, go back... 200 years ago, your intermittent fasting was a way of life. Not because it was cool or trendy, <laughs> but because you just didn't have any no food. So, a few thoughts on that. So, um, with the addition of chlorine into the, the water supply, um, is that in high enough levels to cause dramas in and of itself, or is it only once we start to knock the guts around with things like gluten and dairy that it's got these all like um, the, the chlorine then starts to become a factor? Or do you- and as far as I'm aware, the chlorine itself is a factor all by its own self. Oh, so yeah, it's absolutely. Well, that's my recommendation. Um, you know, the, the municipalities will tell us that it's a perfectly safe amount. And, and my answer is it, it probably is because we use this thing called an LD50 and the dose that we're using is not enough to kill us. You know, by itself, it will not Did kill you. Did I read you. somewhere that, so, um, sorry, jump in, mate. Um, that's okay. Fluoride is a neurotoxin. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, oh, you know, that, that's kind of a, a big can of worms all of its own self. By itself, fluoride is a mineral and it has some positive impacts on human health. The sort of stuff that we're necessarily putting into the, uh, the water supply, which is you know, sodium fluorosilicate, has been shown to be a class five toxin. Uh, it's been kind of lauded to be a byproduct of aluminium smeltering. However, fundamentally, it's in an ionic form that doesn't actually do particularly well for the human body. Um, and there's a bunch of stuff that shows that it actually decreases iodine in the system and it can cause cretinism when it um, outstrips the iodine supply and it dam- damages a whole bunch of stuff. So, you know, there's some supposed benefits. Um, there's not really, regardless of, of what we're all told, particularly strong evidence to actually show that it, it helps uh, adult teeth not have dental cavities the suggestion that it stops dental cavities is kind of relatively okay when you look at the evidence and those under the age of 13 but when you've got adult dentition it doesn't seem to make any positive outcome on your enamel now we're all told that it's it's doing wonderful things but you're not really seeing too many case controlled placebo double blinded and yeah it definitely has some negative impacts you see people with uh, certain types of spotting white yellow mottling on their teeth that's called fluorosis and the fluorosis is that they kind of absorbed it but couldn't use it properly and so they actually have a weakening of their enamel and you'll see patients out there like that yeah. is this going to be one of those mm. things where um, sort of like where they went back and said um, fats are the cause of cholesterol back in the 40s or whatever it was and they, they went back to find the original yep. thing and it turned out to be a an opinion piece in an editorial rather than any actual oh. um, research. Is it going to come back to, you know, the reason why we're putting fluoride in the water was a editorial opinion piece that was written back in the 1920s? Um, no, it's much, much worse than that. And it depends on how big a case of worms you actually want to open on that one. Um, uh, I, I, do, I do like a good, <laughs> good rant, but if, if we're going to say, yeah. hey, the, uh, the moon, moon landing was a hoax. 
<laughs> no, 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 no. We're not looking at anything like that. So there's, there's just really, really good evidence to show where it was actually coming from. And, and the research was actually uh, largely funded by the um, U.S. Defense uh, Department as there was a huge amount of uh, fluoride used to actually develop the uh, atomic bombs in, in the 40s. And, of course, the... Um, Staff were exposed to huge amounts of these um, chemicals, which were, of course, in a potentially neurotoxic and damaging effect uh, and structure. And so it was interesting that the, um, they had scientists start publishing papers. And when you go back through the literature, it, it's showing um, where they actually came out with the information on because it headed off all the lawsuits. They actually um, were running tests on on populations of people exposing them to the amounts of fluoride and waiting to see uh, what the negative end products were. And so this is all in the declassified uh, information from, you know, the late 40s, early 50s and going on. And they, you know, continued to do stuff like dropping or, or exploding atom bombs on atolls in the South Pacific and moving uh, the Polynesians around and then, you know, having them in, in hellish conditions because of that. Um, so... Yeah, unfortunately, the published literature uh, shows that there is a positive impact is, is basically founded on extremely dubious uh, original information. But the issue that we have is that when you have a published paper, as perhaps you could, could suggest maybe claimed as paid for to get into a high quality um, publication, so you buy off the right um, level of, of uh, researcher, um, and the, the person researching has been shown to be a paid employee of the uh, U.S. Department of uh, Defense. So his work then gets published and then other people come along and say, oh, well, that was that was good Snowball peer reviewed published data and, and it just grows. And so when you actually have a lie that um, gets said often enough, it's not actually the truth, but it's taken as truth. And so we've continued over the last kind of 60 odd years, the same statement without anyone going back and, and re-looking at it. Now, the issue with that is that, of course, uh, there are some positive um, information to say that uh, that fluoride is, is good for you, but it, it's in a, a very different ionic structure and in very, very different amounts. I mean, fluoride, again, is an antibacterial and is shown to kind of terminate your thyroid. And we have kind of one in three women in Australia with a hypothyroidic condition. Um, you know, it, it's not not one in three. You know, that's that's the current. Look how many people have morbid obesity out there. It's it's just massive. Yeah, so, um, you know, we're contributing with that. We've also removed the, we used to put iodine in the vats to wash out the milk vats many, many years ago. And we stopped doing that because chlorine's cheaper. So you put chlorine in the vat, which knocks out iodine. You remove the iodine. You have a low iodine supply in soil and diet. And you have the addition of fluoride to the water supply. And given enough time, you get a whole bunch of issues coming out with that. But we're in a situation, of course, that uh, the, the dental uh, powers that be have um, been kind of worked into a corner. You know, they can't very well, and neither can the health department, turn around and say, look, I'm, I'm very sorry. You know, actually, this stuff is highly toxic. Um, yeah, don't use that stuff. Big, big machine to turn around. Um, yeah, well, it, it, it is, and there'll be lawsuits. And so what we have is we just kind of don't really say that it's, it's amazingly beneficial. You're not actually really seeing anyone saying this actually stops cavities. We just um, kind of assumed statements about it and it's implied in the statement. And if you look really closely, no one's really pointing out or, or bringing evidence to actually show that it, it's making a difference. Like it's, it's Queensland recently... Yeah. Now, in in recent times, Queensland's gone on and, and put it in the water supply. And, you know, we're not seeing evidence that it's actually stopping all the dentition problems that we have here in Queensland. Further to that, they've actually started to withdraw it from municipalities in Europe. It's it's banned from going in the water supply because it's been shown to be a problem. Time so, to go to Europe. Well, you know, in some ways, I don't want the weather, no, but um, the the... 
Well, you know, some of that's the prices we pay because, you know, you can't have everything you want. And um, if you want greater health, it's going to cost you. And they're a bit more prepared to make some of those choices and sacrifices than we are uh, here at this moment, which I think is a bit of a shame. I remember, um, did, did you ever see a TV show called uh, The Bomb? Um, it was on like AMC probably like a year or two ago, but anyway, it was, it was basically um, um, sort of following the scientists that developed the bomb out in the middle of um, the desert, wherever it was in the States. Oh, um, right, but yeah. It, it was, um, like, I, you know, I don't know how factually accurate it was, but um, uh, it, it was kind of funny because watching it and they um, essentially had no idea how bad or good or whatever radiation was for everyone. Um, and it was only when, like, one of the main scientists' wife, who was a botanist, started to spot, like, all of these weird things happening to sterility for all of the, um, you know, locals and that there were, you know, plants growing in the area that were sort of abnormal and shouldn't be doing this thing. And then I was like, oh, yeah, so, you know, that big old bomb that you're building? Kind of toxic for us all. We should be having a few more. Like, it's just, you know, and they went on for years and years and years and years without any prediction yeah. because they didn't know, hey, this stuff's bad for you. Um, but it's kind of yeah. weird to think, like, you know, this isn't, you know, it's not that long ago uh, that we're still no. figuring out this sort of shit. Uh, see, uh, I'd say that one is is a, um, a romanticization of the truth. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I think the um, the data on that one's been pretty pretty aware for so I mean, we've had X-ray. The, the, the wife of the guy who, who developed X-ray died of cancer from it you know (laughs) we've known that that radiation of all sorts has been toxic for a fair while um what we have done is is done these very live experiments on people for some while um which you know realistically most of our um earlier part of last century would probably kind of not come up to meet ethical standards for research but you know (laughs) yeah Uh, yeah, well, that that seems to be, and they've they've continued to do that through till you know maybe the seventies, in fact. Um, so I'd say that's a little bit romantic. There's that famous, um, I think it was like the Texas sleep study or something like that. Or the tech, anyway, in in Texas around like the late sixties or seventies, they did a, a trial to see what happens to people if they didn't move at all. Um, and it was uh, so you like confined to bed rest, and there was an allotted amount of steps that you could take to relieve yourself in the bathroom, x amount of times per day. So it was like total, total rest. Um, but I think they had to like discontinue it after two weeks or so because people were starting to you know show signs of you know, you know dementia and all sorts of fun things were going on. Um, but yeah, you you never get that through ethics like these days. But it, I think it's it's sort of just one of those. Hey guys, this is one of the, the fun things. And it, and uh, yeah, I don't know what you're talking about. There was one um, but it was just yeah. They were looking at total sensory deprivation, putting people in, in rooms by themselves and taking all the time away, and people go mad pretty quickly from that sort of stuff. But yeah, um, things you get away with when uh, when yeah, the board weren't that strong. Um, well, that's it. And that's kind of one of the reasons, if we kind of think on it, like as we were talking before, I think what we've alluded to is that uh, it, it's not just the food. There's all these things like the fluoride. There's the antibiotics, the chlorine, the glyphosates. The, they all kind of amount to why uh, yours and my generation and those following are that much less capable of dealing, let alone the fact that the, the food itself has been more processed. There's more acellular, more. Or, uh, gluey sorts of high sugar um, p- product in in our our diets. I, I don't know that um, it's actually that significantly different per wheat, so to speak. I just think that there's a whole bunch of other factors. Uh, you know, we actually grow our food in a very sterile environment these days. And the interesting thing with that is that the the antioxidants are actually created in the plant when it's under stress. So if you create an environment that takes all the stress away from the plant, whether it's in a a hothouse or whether it's in a, um, you know, how we crossbreed these things, it doesn't make a lot of nutrients in it. So when we eat the food, we don't get the nutrients we require to actually make all our systems work. Therefore, when stress hits us, we get more reactions. One of the things I um, came across 
um, it, it was looking at sort of the, one of the later generations of you know, GMO wheat crops, where that there were um, you know, sort of spraying the crops with black phosphate in the herbicide pesticides, that sort of thing. They were putting that in the you know, genetic code of the plant so that you know, wheat essentially built its own black phosphate, so you didn't have to spray. Um, and I was thinking, well, that's great because then you're, you know, you're very much eating black phosphate. But then uh, I was thinking, like, if you didn't have to spray as often, would that not be more beneficial for the soil? Would you not spill any of the extra bugs? It's, it's a really interesting thought process and it, it kind of like I like that as a concept except for the fact that if you've got a chemical in there that is known to have a negative impact internally then you really can't eat the chemical in the plant anyway yeah it's just one of those you know, trying to see the other side of it you imagine oh let's, let's put poison in the food that, that seems like a good idea the kicker to it is is that it's not really wonderfully well shown that spraying lots uh, is actually creating more yield and better outcomes for uh, farmers anyway. What we found is that having a monoculture, so having a intensive crop on a farm that does nothing but that is actually really bad for the soil, bad for the environment, and that you actually need to have uh, different sorts of plants kind of growing together because they all have um, anti-pest, anti-fungal kind of properties that they all lend to each other. It's actually quite symbiotic. And when you have kind of more um, mechanically based uh, traditional farming practices like tilling the soil by hand and kind of pulling up the weeds by hand, we actually get pretty well the same uh, outcomes. Now, I know that if you've got, you know, a, a 50,000 hectare farm, that, that doing that by hand is really a likely impossibility. And that's really what this comes down to is that it's big business agri-farming that's driving the necessity to actually... Um, alter the pesticides, alter the herbicides because you just can't physically manage it um, and therefore you know food supply and health is actually at the uh, at the mercy of commerce and politics and that's really what the problem is. Just to jump back about 20 minutes in the conversation so you mentioned that um, <laughs> like antibiotics and the depopulation of good, but, uh, good gut um, bugs, yep. Um, one of the things that I um, you know, hear from my patients is that uh, you know, it's like, okay, you've done antibiotics, we need to repopulate your, your gut, so let's get on the, uh, the probiotics. Um, but uh, people are sort of thinking that if you took probiotics at the same time as the antibiotics, it was sort of nil or no benefit from doing that. Um, but I, I, I was listening to a podcast um, with uh, Dr. Rhonda Patrick, and she was sort of suggesting that um, uh, it is actually beneficial, uh, beneficial um, that taking probiotics during the course of antibiotics um, could be beneficial in that sort of you know, jumping the gun to repopulate your gut. What, what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, realistically, what's going to occur is that the um, antibiotics may uh, kill off the probiotics at the same time. But the benefit of the and uh, the probiotics rather is more to do with the uh, combined regulatory effect. So. Probiotics aren't really very good at colonizing, so they're not, not there to actually uh, make a big new colony. They're not shown to do that at all well. Uh, what they really seem to do is they go in and they regulate the immunity of the gut wall and the lymphatic tissue in your gut to actually kind of get on top of the inflammation and settle everything down and, and stop the infection. So they, they are absolutely useful to be taking at the time. So with the, the um, antibiotic, um, so, so you should definitely do it, in my opinion. Yeah, that's interesting. I, um, you know, I didn't even know that that big one. So it's more on. Yeah. Okay. There you go. That's cool. Um, the um, so let, let's say because if you've got someone who's mm -hmm. not true celiac and they don't have those genetic that genetic sensitivity <laughs> to gluten or dairy, um, but people are you know like myself don't have that gene but still sensitive to gluten and dairy. Um, I kind of know what you're going to say, <laughs> I'm going to ask you anyway. Um, what, what sort of time, so like let's say we were super strict and we were doing all of the, um, um, well, yeah, what, what sort of routine would you recommend for someone to, um, other than getting rid of gluten and dairy, how would you de-inflame your gut, uh, sort of what's the quick and dirty way of, of do, doing it? Uh, and then um, what sort of 
time frame would you need to stay away from that before you started to say, you know, hey, let's try that gluten and dairy again? <laughs> um, okay, so that, that's a really interesting concept. Uh, obviously, my first starting point is take away the irritants, whether it's gluten, dairy, uh, you know, soy. Um, we, we decrease things like chlorine, uh, fluoride, etc., from the water supplies. I would use some um, glutamine and glycine to start trying to um, soften out the gut lining and decrease the, the lymphatic irritation. I'm using uh, a product called Restore, which is a lignite formulation to actually help heal up the tight junctions with that as well. Um, we might use probiotics like... Can you just um, yep. tell the difference between Restore and the glutamate glycine? Uh, the glutamine glycine are pure amino acids um, and so they have very specific purposes, some of which is to help make um, glutathione, which soaks up oxidative stress. Uh, glutamine itself is shown to actually help stiffen up and, and heal the um, villi in the uh, gut lining itself. Glycine is a, um, a neurotransmitter that helps calm uh, muscles uh, and, and inhibit muscle action, so it can decrease gut muscle spasm at that moment in time and helps modulate the NMDA receptor. Uh, you know, they can do a whole bunch of different things, and I find when they work together, we actually get better results for the gut lining itself. Um, glutamine itself helps recycle glutamic acid and this is a wonderfully popular misconception everyone has that oh uh, you know glutamine helps make uh, glutamic acid excitatory neurotoxin it's going to cause problems well that's not the case you actually require enough free glutamine to actually help recycle the glutamic acid to actually reuse it in your neurotransmitters and keep everything working properly um, so, uh, and, then, and then the restore is um, essentially more focused on healing up pipe junction. Um, well, yeah, absolutely. Um, that's that's um, uh, what it's used for. So it's shown to actually protect by about seventy-ish percent from the damaging effects of things like glyphosate and gluten gliadin uh, in experiments. So it's one of the reasons why I use it because the evidence is clear that it absolutely can have that positive impact. My personal evidence in my own use is that it definitely has an impact. So, you know, those are things that I'd put in there. If we're suspicious of, you know, like stomach acid um, reduction, we might use a uh, betaine hydrochloride um, supplement or we might use, um, you know, cider vinegars or lemon juice before meals to try and pick things up. I might also use digestive enzymes to support that uh, function. We might use something like Saccharomyces boulardii or otherwise. Sometimes we'll run uh, a fecal sample, which will tell us a bit more about what's happening, whether they've got zonulin in there that might be showing that they're having interesting leaky guts or whether you know, that they're having uh, a too little IgA or you know, do they have protein digestion going on? Are they malabsorbing fats? And we can get a lot of information from that sort of test, but that's a, a whole topic all of its own self. Um, and, and we'll kind of look at at how that gut situation is going. Now, the other thing I kind of like to do, and I, I probably differ from a lot of uh, you know nutrition medicine practitioners, is that if you haven't looked at the patient's uh, neurocognitive stress response, it doesn't really matter what you're doing at the gut. If you haven't got that vagus nerve under control and calm down that midbrain, they're going to keep winding and creating stress that keeps damaging things because cort cortisol release alone is shown to damage the tight junction and cause leaking. So you've got to get that brain calmed down. And this is where people like you come in uh, and absolutely imperative it is to actually get that brain working in the right direction for its own harmony. Now, I know that there's a big link and, and everyone talks about the gut-brain axis and, and if you're not doing the... And that's absolutely the case. You need to be looking at both at the same time. But... You know, too many practitioners are going, oh, look, I gave you the probiotic. Here's your thing. Let's, oh, it's great. And they're missing that brain. All gut, no brain. Correct. So that's that's kind of the big difference. I think that's really important to note for your listeners. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so what sort of a, so let's say we did the appropriate brain rehabilitation based on the stimulation, get that autonomic nervous system behaving itself doing what it wants. Um, uh, and the, the appropriate um, supplementation to calm down any, any gut irritation. Um, 
What's the sort of immune memory um, oh. for gluten sensitivity, dairy sensitivity? This, this is where it sucks. So you can expect to see good results in like six weeks, six to 12 weeks, depending on which thing you're actually dealing with. But if you've got full on antibodies made, you know, it's, it's 18 months to clear the liver, uh, the kidneys rather, and up to three years before you're back to baseline. Um, so every time you spike yourself with another cross-contamination, your levels go back up again, and then it takes a while to go back down. Now, the further away from it you get, the less reactive you become, uh, and you slowly and steadily heal, but it's a lot longer than everyone thinks. You know, I, I was in there myself. Back in the day, I would go off gluten and dairy for a month, and I was probably not very kind of clean about it as well and I'd go back on and I'd feel no different so I'd go oh look I've got no problem but back to normal. yeah it, it's it's a month just isn't enough for the average person like for extreme responders you might see a difference and feel better in a week or two weeks but that's not the same as healing and getting everything glued up because again your gut is a two steps forward one step backwards situation always you can't take a break from your gut you always have to keep sticking food in so this is kind of where people go ah oh, 72 hour fast they, they really decrease uh, you know gut inflammation and, and that's absolutely the case but I still don't recommend them a whole bunch because most of these people are already in a malnourished state so where did you get the nutrients from to keep you going when you didn't eat it's eat the rest of your body mm. So you got to be careful with that. But this is a big key thing. Everyone's talking about different amounts of fasting and how great it is for you and kind of three-day fasts and five-day fasts. And, and it's just not necessarily as good as people think uh, unless you're sticking IV nutrients in. One of the things I was thinking about with fasting, cause I'm, especially from the brain gut again, Jesus, I need the coffee. And the brain gut access issue. <laughs> Um, so that when you're doing your fasting to clear up the guts, um, to try and promote that vagal stimulation, because you know, if you're not eating, you're not getting any of the peristalsis, your parasympathetic, your digestive system, neurologically, is just not getting activated the same way um, than when you're eating regularly. Um, so uh, I was thinking, you know, chewing gum um, as a way of, sort of promoting a little bit of parasympathetic nerve, could you get that, that sort of uh, digestive system still firing neurologically um, but then I'm sort of trying to look around and find chewing gum that doesn't have any artificial sugars in it which is turning it from positive. <laughs> um, well the one that I use is has xylitol in it um, which is you know it's an alkanol um, and too much of it can cause uh, diarrhea so it's somewhat self-limiting at that moment in time and people argue whether it's good bad or indifferent I don't tend to find it's too big a problem for most people um, and so that's kind of the one I, I'd suggest trying. It's Spry Gum. What's the name of that one? Spry. Spry. S-P-R-Y. Okay. I'll look into that one because, yeah, that was... Um, yeah. Bit of a trauma. Yeah. Um, it's got no other negative artificial things in it. Um, mm. You know, if you could trust the person, you can actually get them a nice, clean, small river stone or piece of quartz uh, and, and suck and roll that around in the mouth as well it'll do kind of the same thing but you have to know that they're not going to be uh, kind of punched in the face obviously or, or likely to swallow it <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a good point. don't swallow the rock yeah um, you'd think that would be blind, yeah um, yeah okay because yeah I, I certainly noticed for myself that um, so I mean I've been working with you for three years now four years now something like that yep um, but it's you know it, 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 I'll be the first one to admit that every now and then Sorry. I have a little slip I know uh, a little slip up and uh, you know you get exposed to something and then it's like okay well, let's start the clock again yeah. but I'm certainly not reacting nearly as much as, as even a year ago no. but, um, as, as you get more robust and your levels of nutrition actually come up and your stress levels come down and that's absolutely why I'm saying we've got to get the brain under control at the same time because you can keep pouring nutrients in until the cows come home if you keep chewing through them you're just not going to hold on um, and so that's really good to hear so, so where because I know we've said that brief off air chat last week um, and you were talking about the eosinophils being a measure of an allergic reaction 
Um, sure. It would be, that be a sort of measure that people could take um, to say, you know, hey, um, uh, are we heading in the right direction? Am I staying away from gluten and dairy frequently and often enough? Um, whereas if the levels are still the same, you're saying, hey, you need to do better. Um, yes, that, that's certainly possible. So eosinophils will respond to toxin, uh, allergy response, as well as parasites. So mm, we okay. can't... We can't kind of cleanly go yep that's that's what it is um, but it's a good place to start and if you're seeing them staying up then you need to be looking at other things at the same time um, because you know you might have cleaned out the gluten and dairy but they've still got a um, a blastocystis hominis infection in their lower bowel and that's not going to do them any good yep that sounds um mate, you're giving out my personal information there hey. oh it, it wasn't <laughs> intentional but <laughs> <laughs> you just peaked the one um but uh yeah so yeah well, okay so for you said it was a staying high then there's there's something else going on that they've got to look at yeah absolutely okay um, well, but yeah, again, if your ears and are staying uh, high, you really shouldn't be on the gluten theory anyway. Correct. Um, uh, one of the last things I wanted to, to talk about, so have you ever read that book, um, uh, Grain Brain? Yes, yep. I, I, I really like it. Um, uh, I don't like all of it. He, as a neurologist, it's really nice for him to be talking about um, the, the psychogenic effect of foods creating mm-hmm. trouble for us. Um, and I, I kind of like what he's saying, which is that, you know, saturated fats are really good for the brain. And because the brain is so heavily made of saturated fat, you've got to have good quality sources of it going in. And the problem then becomes that his uh, source of that is uh, dairy products in a large amount mm-hmm. of the cases. And the issue there is of course and certainly in my opinion a lot of the research and literature there's no fundamental difference between the dairy proteins and casein and gluten so you're still going to get the negative reaction and so he's saying well eat eat this one and it you know it's great and and this one's bad and you're not actually going to get anywhere with it I, I, I think I do it. I must admit that I got halfway through that book and you know how you're, you're reading your book and you're like okay I know what the conclusion is which is don't eat gluten. How many, how many times? Oh, like each step. Oh, reason number 40,000 to not eat gluten. Is, okay. I've, I think yep. I've got the, the gist of the book. Let's put that one down. Pretty much. <laughs> um, <clears throat> mate, this has been a good chat. I think no we've, worries. We've, we've, <laughs> we, we, we've rambled, but we've, we've nailed that gluten sensitivity issue. I think. Awesome. Um, but, mate, next time I'd love to... Let's pick the brain about that... Um, uh, neuropathic or pain in general from a from a brain and gut and, and everything in between. Uh, point cool. Um, no I, trouble. I think that'd be a great thing to talk about. Awesome. Uh, any final thoughts? Uh, well, don't eat gluten. <laughs> <laughs> you, you'd hope by the end of this people would be uh, yeah okay maybe oh. I really shouldn't be um, showing down. <laughs> um, all right, mate. Good chat. Catch you around. Okay. No trouble. Bye. Ah, that was good. Guys, as always, if you've got any questions at all, feel free to email me at eric at brainandbodyhealth.com.au or you can give me a holler at Brain and Body Health on 98176611 with the area code 02. Uh, if you want to chat to Scotty, Scotty can be found uh, on or he can be called on 07337102222 and his clinic's name is Optimal Life Chiropractic. So if you Google that, you're going to see heaps. Um, look, that was a good talk on gluten. I hope we all understand the perils and if it is something that's bother you, stay away from gluten. Um, uh, I'm going to try and do what I can to get rid of some of those bloody parrots. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, again, apologies, guys. We'll turn down the forest next time. Thank you for watching. To learn more from Dr. Scott, visit our site at optihuman.com.au.